Major support for these broadcasts is provided by New York Community Bank, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chelsea Lighting, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Genova Burns, Gian Tomasi and Webster, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, The Wickhoff Group, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, Bruce Mosler, C.B. Richard Ellis, Colliers International, New York, LLC, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, DDG Partners, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Flushing Bank, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, John Katsimatidis, Red Apple Group, Madison Realty Capital, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Massey Knackle Realty Services, New Banks, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Sterling and Sterling, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, and These Friends. His name is Salvatore Ziza. He's a Brooklyn boy, but he was born in Italy. He's, I, I, I don't know, what, what I call him a serial entrepreneur. I'd say he's an entrepreneur. He's an individual. Everybody knows Sal in New York, and I'm so happy to have Salvatore Ziza today. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much for having me. So we, you know, you and I are contemporaries. We're Brooklyn boys. You know, we should be very happy. The Barclays Center is open, everything over there. Tell me, uh, tell me a little bit about your dad. You said your dad was an entrepreneur in Italy before the war. That is correct. And then what happened? And then he went into the war um, on the Italian side, obviously. Came back, and uh, I was born in November of 45, and he already had three children, so he had to go back into the business. And um, as we all know, Europe was devastated. So he was in the, the citrus business? He was in the citrus business, and what he did was... He bought oranges from the landowners, the orchard growers, and then he would have them picked, packed in a warehouse and shipped throughout Italy because the oranges from that area of Sicily are known as the best oranges. And he did that successfully for a number of years. And then one year where he made his uh, uh, mistake was that he bet quite heavily and there was a frost. Can't always do it with those frosts. And obviously, he lost a lot of money. So it's 1956, and um, due to the McCarran Act, the, the, the rules had changed, and uh, the Zizas come to uh, America. Now, you had no relatives here to speak of, your mother and father, but you had a, a distant cousin. Right? My mother had a distant cousin who she probably hadn't seen in 50 years, 60 years. So in essence, we had no relatives. So you come over, and the family of six moved to this apartment on 24th? No, uh, uh, the actual address was 2336 82nd Street. Right. That's in, in the, the Benson Bensonhurst section. Bensonhurst section right. over there. Bensonhurst section there. So the family is there, the six of you in the one-room one, one apartment. Uh, One-bedroom one apartment. apartment. And the, the bathroom. Right. And at that time, you said your father really couldn't find a job at the beginning. He couldn't find a job because obviously he didn't speak English. He didn't have a trade. He wasn't a tailor. He wasn't a barber. He wasn't an electrician. He wasn't a stonemason. So he was very frustrated. And but your older brother, you said, my be older brother became an auto mechanic. Became an auto mechanic. Your sisters and your mother became seamstresses. seamstresses. So they were, in essence, supporting the family. 
And uh, then finally a year and a half goes by and he finally is able to get a, a menial job at a bakery called Mazzola Brothers Bakery, also in Bensonhurst. Stayed there for about a year, year and a half, and then he moved to the a Silver company. Silver Star Ravioli. Silver Star Ravioli on McDonald Avenue, right. correct. So young Saziza, who came over at 10, at the age of 12, uh, okay, you went to uh, Booty? Uh, I went to PS 97 first. Uh, when I graduated PS 97, which was the elementary school, then I went to PS 228 Booty Junior High School. Before we get to Lafayette, but at 12 years of age, you know, and, and some people appreciate, hey, I live not far away. There was Rollerama. To get a job at Rollerama. That's what was correct. Rollerama? Rollerama at the time was a bingo hall on the first floor and was a bowling alley on the second floor. So um, I needed to work. I needed to get some money because right. we didn't have that much money. So I started working at about 12 years old. So what were you doing there? You serving were... coffee and Danish <laughs> to the elderly ladies that played bingo. Right. So the bingo hall. Okay. The bingo hall. And then later on in your life, you even acted as a short order cook there, right? I, I went, then I moved upstairs. You moved upstairs. <laughs> into the bowling alley. Worked as a mechanic in the back of the bowling alley. You know, when pins got stuck or whatever, you moved them around. And then became the short order cook for the little restaurant operation. Now, what about spinners? You know, growing spinners, up in Brooklyn, they were, there was Big Apple, there was Bohack, you know. Yeah, the, right. Bohack. Yeah, uh, there were other stores, you know. Waldbounds. Waldbounds. Uh, and Spinners. And Spinners was literally uh, three blocks away from where we lived on 86th Street between 23rd and 24th Avenue. And I worked there first as a stock boy and I couldn't make enough money, so I became a delivery guy. So I went on their truck delivering groceries to people that bought them and I got so, so what happens tips. later on is so when you graduate booty you go to Lafayette, Lafayette High School you know the arch rivals of Lincoln right and uh, that's you, correct now you didn't tell me but when I was watching the video it said that you were the uh, the captain of the soccer team that's correct so uh, in those years as you well know soccer was not very big in America <laughs> that's right so, baseball was the, so know, the baseball. only kids we had were immigrants that were on the team and so I I be I played and, and I became the captain of the soccer team at Lafayette High School, but couldn't go on to play in college because very few colleges had soccer programs. Now, you were talking to me about your dad over the years, you know, after he got the job, when you were first starting in business, uh, you were like the translator. Your, your father bought over the period of time, let's say a total of 120 apartment units That's uh, in the Bensonhurst neighborhood over That's there. Correct. And Tell me the story of how your dad would use you as the shill, as the translator. Well, since he didn't speak English, and he never spoke English until he died, um, he made sure that I was at every single meeting because I was the only one in the family that was going to school. And I learned English in six months, so I was able to pick up pretty quickly. And when we bought the first house, which was a four-family house, I negotiated with the seller, who happened to be an elderly Jewish man. I negotiated with the lawyer, who didn't speak Italian, and I negotiated for the mortgage. So I started learning at uh, 13 years old, because we bought that first house in three years, how, what real estate was. And in those days, you had uh, the... Um, rent control regulations, which were burdensome. So my father would say, we got to figure out how to do this, how to move this person out of the apartment. So it good, good experience. It you was know, great experience. It, it, was your other, it was your apprenticeship to take away from Spinners and Rollerama. You had your business. That's correct. Right. Now, you graduate um, uh, Lafayette, and then you said you had an opportunity. You could have gone to City College, but as you said to me when we got together, 133rd Street was a, too far of a schlep for a kid from Brooklyn, right? Exactly. So you decided to go to St. John's, and at, which at that time was in Brooklyn. In with, Brooklyn. Where they had their roots on Skemmerhorn Street over there. That's correct. And uh, what do you go for? I go there for political science. I had this uh, idea that I wanted to be a lawyer, and in order to be a lawyer, you got to study political science, and then maybe you end up you know, practicing law or being in politics. So during during school, did you work at Rollerama when you were going to? I, I worked throughout 
the four years. <clears throat> During school, I worked on the weekends at Spinner's, continuing to deliver, and in Rollerama. And then in the summer, you in the summer, had Western... Uh, Western Electric. Western Electric was was a was subsidiary New of New York Telephone because a friend of mine's father was an executive there, so he got me a job there, and I worked there for four summers. So you graduate college, and you're thinking of law school, and you then, there are some uh, executive training programs available. Correct. And at that time, you know, the, this is when banks were existing banks. You know, we first had something called First National City Bank, which subsequently became Citibank. We had the Chase Manhattan Bank. Exactly. We had Chemical Bank. We had Manufacturers Hanover and some others. And there was a good opportunity, and one of, one of the premier banks was Chemical Bank. And they hire you for this management training program. Yes, I, I realized that I couldn't afford to go to law school. So um, I decided to try and get into one of the training programs. And in those years, the banks had 18 months, 24 months of training to make you uh, understand banking and become a, what was then known as a commercial lending officer. So I was fortunate to get the job with Chemical Bank, went into their training program, and um, was getting paid to learn. And my father couldn't believe it. Right. And then, you know, as many of us, you know, during the Vietnam War conflict, would have two opportunities. We, we could either be a school teacher to get a <laughs> deferment, or we could uh, try our luck uh, to uh, maybe get into the reserves. And, That's correct. Uh, and that, was a, that was a skill in itself, trying to find the right reserve unit. Uh, mine was in uh, Fort Tilden, uh, right where they had the Hurricane Sandy uh, problems. And you, you got to Fort Totten, right? I got to Fort Totten. I, got, I had gotten my token to go down to 39 Whitehall Street. When you got one token, you knew you weren't coming back. And um, then two weeks after I got the token, I got the notification that I was accepted into the uh, Army Reserves. So, of course, I went down immediately, signed up, and, and, and was spared going into active duty. Right, so you go to Fort Knox. So I then, no, I don't go to Fort Knox then. I'm, I'm now in the program with, with uh, Chemical, and I'm now attending graduate school at night at St. John's, John's University correct. for my MBA. And then in April of 09, I have to go do active duty at Fort Knox, Kentucky. So I'm there from April to October, six months. And so I did my basic training, my advanced individual training, and then I came back. You were a cook, right? I was a cook. You were a cook. Okay. <laughs> so uh, Canada, New York cooks, you know, it was all the same seat. Exactly. So you come back, you're continuing at St. John's, and then... The, the training program ends, and you end up in a uh, location of chemical, which was originally the Bensonhurst National Bank. In, That's correct. In Brooklyn. Not far, because you're a, a Bensonhurst boys. But a lot of people from the real estate business used to bank at this branch. That is correct. And you said to me the Calico. The Calicos, the both Nathan and Harold Calico, whose um, sons are Richard and uh, Peter Calico. And there was also Atlas Construction. So there was a lot of activity there um, in the real estate area. So, I mean, I, I had already been learning from my father. <clears throat> we now owned uh, three buildings. And so this was a, a, just a, an enhancement of, of the educational experience regarding real estate. So it's chemical, and then what happens? And then I, I'm there six years, and... Um, there's an opportunity in Lower Manhattan? There's an opportunity to switch banks to American Bank and Trust, smallish bank, 70 Wall Street. And um, I took it because it was a, a significant increase in pay. It was an AVP, a member of the credit committee. Yeah. I mean, come on, you were a kid. You know, this was, was a great kid. opportunity. I was exactly you know? right. I was yeah. 26 years old because I started chemical at 20, 21. And I went there, and I was there a year, and I got an opportunity there, being there a year, from uh, someone who was a client uh, by the name of Ed Fleck with a company called Mortgage e Affiliates Corp that was a mortgage broker. And, and they had a tremendous business in, in the healthcare area, um, nursing homes, skilled care, uh, and, and rehabilitation homes. And he uh, wanted me to go to work for him. And I said, okay, I went to work with them. And then we, we gradually moved from a 
brokerage only to a mortgage banking. We accomplish that by going and getting lines of credit with the Bank of New York then and Citibank. And then what we started doing was uh, originating commercial loans, which we then participated out to all the various uh, small savings institutions in upstate New York, Hudson Valley, you know, Rochester, Buffalo, and so on. And we built a pretty good business in a very short period of time. Now, during that period of time, you meet the legendary Mead Esposito, right? Correct. And Mead was, um, what would you call Mead, a politician? Mead uh, was uh, the most powerful unelected official in the state of New York because he was the uh, Democratic head of Brooklyn, which had the most people. And Mead says, hey, kid, uh, there's an organization that a nice Italian kid should join, right? That's correct. And that foundation was called the Columbus Club. Correct. Uh, which I've had many f good friends and v many good evenings at. Right. And at 30 years of age, you joined the Columbus Club. Well, it was a very, very acute story because you need two sponsors. So I said, Mead, I don't know anybody else. He said, don't worry, I'll get you the guy. Who does he get me is Joe Carlino who's a Republican, Meade is a Democrat, so those were my two sponsors at the Columbus Club. Now, but it's very interesting when, because later on in life when we talk about your career today, you meet another young guy who's at that time an analyst, uh, a Wall Street analyst, it may have been uh, Rhodes and Company or Load Robes and Company, a guy named Mario Gabelli. Right? Yes. So you, the two of you were new members, right? New members, we, we were interviewed the same evening and then we were accepted uh, the same evening. And there's a third guy there by the name of Lee Rizzuto, who owns Con Air. We all happened to be there that same evening being interviewed. And uh, we hit it off, and the three of us are still very friendly to today. And um, I've had a, a very... Lee's another Brooklyn boy, right? Lee's another Brooklyn boy. He went to Brooklyn Tech. He's from um, the New Utrecht Avenue area. Right. So... Um, uh, Mario and I have been very friendly. And you sit on the board of, I sit on, of, on, of the on funds? on boards of, of his mutual funds. Um, he manages uh, my money uh, from my pension plan, my children's money, and um, it's just been a great, great relationship over the years. So you're, you're at Mortgage Affiliates, and you also, through the club, meet the legendary Mr. Peters. Yes, Leone Peters, right. who had been the uh, CEO of Cushman and Wakefield, and he was the one that sold it to RCA back then. And um, he was quite a uh, uh, highly respected uh, real estate person. And Leon says to you, uh, kid, uh, maybe you can help one of my clients when my son's working to get a, a loan for a construction company? Correct. So tell us, tell his me. Son, his son, Paul Peters, who happens to be my age, uh, happened to be working for uh, an interior construction firm called H.L. Lazar. And apparently they were having some uh, financial difficulties and Leon asked me to go in there and see if I could do something for them. So I went in and, and did some due diligence, looked at their financial statement and realized that they had very good clients. Um, the American Expresses, Chemical Bank, Chase Bank, all the law firms, insurance companies. And I was able to get them a line of credit for $1 million. And that, that helped them for a while. And then Howard Lazar, who was the son of Herbert, uh, sorry, of Leonard Lazar, who was running the business at the time, said, you know, um, I'd like you to stay and work with me and we'll be co-chief executives, but I don't know anything about finance but I know how to get business and, and I know how to And you knew nothing build. about construction. Yeah, and I knew nothing about construction. So it was a perfect uh, marriage. And um, we were able to raise a million dollars in equity um, and were able to turn the company around. And then five years later, we went uh, public through E.F. Hutton because my childhood friend, Richard Hockman, had become an investment banker at E.F. Hutton, so uh, it was quite uh, interesting that two kids growing up in Bensonhurst um, end up doing business together and he took us public. 
through an initial public offering. And, and NICO grew, I mean, to the level of... Uh, NICO went from, uh, when we took it over, $60 million to over $850 million in a 10-year period. Right, and you were basically, the one, of, if not the largest interior construction company. We, we were the largest uh, by uh, uh, quite a bit, and uh, we had opened offices all over the United States and in Europe, in London, and, and in Paris. So we, um, we worked very hard to increase the business dramatically. Subsequently, there was the LVI, the, the merger, the reverse merger, right. and so on. Right. And um, subsequently, you decide after how many years were you at NICO? We, uh, NICO from 1978 to 1993. In 1993, one thing that you had always done, you know, you kept your ears out because you had the Bergen Cove real estate Correct. operation in the residential business, but you also kept in touch with a number of people. You decided to to reopen, which was always open, Zeezer and Company. Correct. The financial consulting and business consulting. And over the years, since 1994 to the present time, you've been involved with lots of companies where you sit on as the, the chairman or the operating chairman or the executive chairman Correct. of a number of companies. Let's talk about some of them because some of them are so interesting. Yeah, o o over the years I developed a, a, a thought that said, you know what, I like the operating aspects of a business. I have financial background, I have financial skills. So if I could invest my money directly into a company, which I like and I like the management of it, I could be the chairman involved with regards to strategy and finance and the folks that really understand the industry that have been in the industry a long time will do the operation. So let's talk about it. We have BAM. What's BAM? BAM is a, um, a company in Knoxville, Tennessee that was an orphan uh, of, of a public company. And one of the uh, people that worked with me at LVI Alan Silverstein, came to me and said, I think this is a great opportunity for us to be able to buy it. And BAM, at that time, was only building high-temperature furnaces, these big, humongous things that are used to heat uh, carbon fiber, ceramics, things of that nature. And it's in, in Knoxville, which is near Oak Ridge Laboratories. And so there's tremendous engineers that come out of there, but they don't know how to commercialize products. So Alan said, if we buy it, you know, we could probably do very well with this. And I said, I would only buy it if you stay there and run it. He said, I can't stay there, but I'll run it. So we've had a very successful run there for about 12 years. Uh, we bought it in 2000, and, and uh, we're still owning it and running it. And one of our major clients is Honeywell. Now, landing gear system. Now, now, another company, you know, and this is closer to our heart of growing up in New York City and operating in New York City, is the recycling business. Or Correct. The, or the carting business or whatever. Correct. Tell me about that. Um, I, after uh, Rudy Giuliani um, was able to break the carting... Um, cartel, we Cartel. Mean. I want to use the right words. I uh, thought there would be a big um, gap and, and I could fill that gap by buying companies, merging it together, doing a roll-up, consolidating them. And uh, what happened was I was not able to convince the small operators that they would be better off joining us, becoming part of a public company. And so finally I met someone, Paul McClintock, who said to me, I sell our paper th that I pick up to a company called Metropolitan Paper, and I think they need financing. Would you be interested? And one of the activities I have is called Primary Capital, which lends money uh, on a secondary basis, either it's mortgages, receivables, uh, land, whatever, and that gives me entree into possible companies that, that, that I could buy into. Well, this particular company needed financing and I got to know the, the uh, Bianco family, and they had bought the company from um, Browning Ferris Industries, so, um, but they didn't have any equity. So I, w I went in there, I did my homework, I did about a, a year and a half worth of due diligence, <clears throat> finally came to the conclusion 
that this could be a terrific industry because the green movement is on, it's not going backwards. Right, so you, you do recycling, you know, paper, other products over there, and you're also, you, you're doing the work for the post office. Uh, the, the United States Post, post office, office is a big client. Macy's. Macy's a big client. Bloomingdale's a big client. Metropolitan Logan Museum. Taylor, the Metropolitan Museum is a big client, and the biggest client is the Department of Sanitation, where uh, we uh, get their trucks to come and deliver the recyclables that they pick up. But only in paper. We don't. We don't get the plastics. Now, another company that you're involved with is this, um, the biotech company. Let's talk right. about, about, about Harbor Biosciences. Uh, I had raised seven million dollars in 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 a public shell, uh, well before all these shells uh, started happening in 1993. And I was introduced to a a biotech company. That, that had um, a platform of trying to develop a particular molecule. And so we merged with that company, which at the time was called Hollis Eden Pharmaceuticals. And Hollis Eden was developing an HIV drug, was developing uh, an, uh, an anti-radiation drug called Numune. And so I stayed on the board and then um, became chairman about three years ago. And we're still uh, doing research. You're involved with an adrenaline steroid product? With, with, with uh, Apoptone, which is a uh, prostate cancer, and with Triolex, which is diabetes. But we've done a very interesting um, joint venture with a Chinese uh, major pharmaceutical company who took on all of the clinical trials because it's much easier to do clinical trials and a lot less expensive to do it in China than here. And we have, we have certain thresholds that once they meet certain uh, thresholds, we start getting money from them. But they're doing all of the money. Right. With two, minute, with two minutes left, uh, I, I want to go on about a little bit of family and other involvement. Sure. Uh, in addition, you're involved with the Translux Corporation. And you're Correct. also involved with the E... Um, a general Employment Enterprises. General, general Employment out of Chicago and the E-Word. Uh, the e E corporate English. E, e corporate English. Something that you've been involved with uh, your entire career is the Italian Found National uh, Federation. The, the, it's called the National Italian American Foundation. Uh, yes, since 1976, I have been uh, heavily involved there. Um, I finally um, became president of that organization in 2005 to 2009. It's um, something that I really enjoy doing, helping. Uh, the Italian American um, people become better uh, known for the, all of the good things that they've done in America, as opposed to um, getting smeared with uh, bad publicity. Let's talk about the, uh, the the best part of your life. The three boys. Tell me about your son. Yes, I I, uh, I have a 27 year old, uh, almost 27 who is living in London working for a startup uh, trading company called Frary Hall. Um, he's been there since June of, of uh, 2012. I have a 25-year-old um, who is a Boston College graduate, philosophy uh, and history major, and um, he is working out in Lake Tahoe. And I have a 23-year-old who graduated from Loyola University in Maryland who works for the Brookfield Property uh, company, which is a, a very large real estate business. You've been very close to St. John's, 2007. You got an honorary doctorate, you know, Correct. Like Dr. Sal. Over Correct. There. Correct. But uh, you know, um, you've been a. You know, it's nice to see guys from Brooklyn who work hard, be creative, be successful, and you've been a great New York story. And thanks for being. Thank here. you very much.